hello everyone and welcome back to my channel so as i mentioned in my previous video that i've started this series read robins with me in which i target a particular chapter from robins and i take you through the most high yielding areas of that particular chapter so before i start i'm going to give a few disclaimer number one is that i have tried to amalgamate the uh, syllabus from the point of view of the mbbs undergraduate second year students and also keeping in mind the approach to neat pg because we know that in neat pg the conceptual questions are asked nowadays and uh, the concept that robbins offers you know it is the gold standard it can be used in various other subjects as well being pathology is the basis uh, of a lot of uh, diseases uh, that we encounter i cannot stress any more on the importance of reading robbins i've already explained that in my previous video why it is very important to go through at least the most high yielding areas uh, the images the tables uh, you know the flow charts in robbins are a must do for all categories of students mbbs undergraduates and also for the from the point of view of the post graduation entrance examinations of any type neat pg inct fmg or whatever and is also important from the point of view of post graduate students essentially so i have only highlighted the most high yielding areas and i will also take you through the most important mcqs and the concepts behind solving those mcqs the second disclaimer is that i'm going to go a little bit fast so if you can't understand anything you have to stop the video and repeat that at segment once again if you are an mbbs undergraduate student then please open the robins in front of you and read it with me then you will learn it the best because this series is read robins with me and underline and keep underlining and keep reading it with, with me and number two is if you are a neat pg going student uh, please listen to these videos at a 2x speed because all the important concepts you will be able to brush up very soon so uh, and if you are definitely a postgraduate student then again you have to keep the robins open in front of you because that will give you the best uh, opportunity to read robins and finish it here itself okay along with me first i have taken up the general pathology segments first i'm going to finish these chapters first and since you know that i'm in my second year so balancing my uh, residency along with my self study along with this uh, making these videos requires a lot of effort and dedication so uh, i'm i'm trying to post the general pathology first and then i will decide upon the further course of action in this video i'm going to do the chapter of cell as a unit of health and disease so before starting as i've already mentioned in my previous video that if you talk about the neat uh, pg exam then basically the concepts is what forms your gut feeling okay and this is supposedly the most important for any mcq solving so gut feeling develops with your concept and that is why i have brought about this series where i'm going to discuss the concepts in detail so starting with the very first thing that is there are five classes of something called as the functional non protein coding sequences now what do you mean by non protein coding sequences non protein coding sequences means that those sequences which do not undergo translation they do not produce any kind of protein this is very important because they have a very important role in regulation of the human genome now what are these areas promoter enhancer regions some of the binding sites of chromatin structures the non coding regulatory rnas and this is a very important short note i'm going to talk about it later and some mobile genetic elements which are called the transposons and also the telomeres now what is telomeres telomeres are basically the uh, nucleotide repetitive nucleotide sequences which are present at the terminus of the chromatids and they permit the chromosomal replication without deterioration of genes near the ends so these are present near the ends which prevent uh, the deterioration of these genes and that is how they kind of inhibit the cell senescence so this is a very important thing to understand another important question here is that the characteristic binding pattern of chromatids has been attributed to the concentration or the content which is the gc content so this is another important mcq that gc content is the most important part when you talk about the characteristic binding pattern of the chromatids now another important mcq is that when you talk about the genetic variations these are known as polymorphisms right so genetic variations known as polymorphisms now these are associated with these non protein coding sequences another important question when we talk about polymorphisms the answer associated will be non protein coding sequences which is a question i hope that makes sense now you must understand that chroma heterochromatin right heterochromatin is the inactive form of a chromatin which does not undergo transcription and euchromatin is the dispersed chromatin which is active and that ultimately undergoes transcription translation formation of proteins now what happens is if you talk about histone acetylation acetylation opens up the chromatin and that increases the transcription we know that 
uh, this euchromatin when it is dispersed when the chromatin is dispersed opened up that is when the transcription happens so acetylation will open up the chromatin will increase the transcription and methylation will condense the chromatin and that will decrease the transcription this is again a very important concept to know now coming to this important short note which is the micro rna and long non coding rnas this was what i'm talking about just a few minutes back this is uh, something called as the non coding rnas now please understand this concept is difficult to understand so i'm going to take you through it very slowly when we talk about the non coding rnas okay non coding rnas means these rnas will not undergo translation they will not undergo translation they will not produce the proteins okay but what they will do is that they will modulate or rather they will regulate the gene expression so gene gene regulation is is very important it's not always that every genome of the body has to produce protein there also have to be some regulatory mechanisms present in the body and that regulatory mechanism is this which is called as the non coding rnas composed of two kinds of rnas number one is the micro rna and number two is the long non coding rnas which is more than 200 nucleotides in length which is an important mcq okay so we must understand what they do they cause gene silencing they do not produce the protein they do not undergo translation they prevent the translation they prevent the protein encoding and they silence the gene so the silencing of the gene expression is done by the mirna very very important question so uh, this actually has a role to play with uh, you know this this is a critical regulator of developmental pathways as well as pathological conditions known in especially in the cancer so obviously because they are regulatory uh, mechanisms okay so now once we come to this diagram this is a very complicated diagram i you must understand this see this is first this is the mirna okay now from this mirna there is production of primary mirna from which there is production of pre mirna this pre mirna will be transported into the cytoplasm by this export proteins and there is an enzyme called the dicer enzyme and this dicer enzyme will ultimately uh, kind of uh, act on this pre mirna to much uh, to generate okay this dicer enzyme will act on this pre mirna to generate something called as the mirna which is 21 to 30 nucleotides in length now this mirna will now unwind into two single stranded rna as you can see it's mentioned over here that this mirna will subsequently unwind and the single strands are incorporated into the risk complex so this will unwind into two single stranded RNAs and they ultimately are getting incorporated into this complex called as the risk complex. Now, what is the what is the full form of risk complex? It is the RNA induced silencing complex. So ultimately, that's what we are doing. Ultimately, we are kind of silencing the gene expression. So once it is getting uh, incorporated in this RNA complex, two things may happen. The base pairing between this mirna and the target mRNA, which has to be silenced, if the base pairing, the base matching happens between these two kinds of genes, then if it is a perfect match, if the base pairing is matching, then there's going to be mRNA or mrna cleavage okay and if it is an imperfect match if, if it doesn't match then it is going to repress the translation so there are two mechanisms one is the repression and one is the cleavage if it is a perfect match it will do the cleavage of the mrna if it is an imperfect match between the base pairing then it will cause repression of the translation both ways the mrna is going to get silenced and there's going to be gene silencing okay if it is a cleavage then there has to be a perfect match and the vice versa so this is again an important mcq okay so i hope that this makes sense if not then please listen to it again because i know this is difficult but i can't go through it over and over again because of time constraint now the second part as we can see is the long non-coding rnas which again modulate the gene expression okay so as you can see what happens over here how does this long non-coding RNAs kind of regulate the gene expression as, as we can see number one is that sometimes they also cause gene activation as you can see here and of course gene uh, suppression okay and uh, they, there's also some uh, function of the uh, you know methylation and acetylation which is the histone and DNA modification can also take place through this kind of uh, mrRNAs through this kind of long non-coding rnas and sometimes these act as scaffold to stabilize the secondary or tertiary structures and the multi subunit complexes so it also acts to stabilize the uh, multi-unit complexes of the chromosomes so 
I hope that makes sense. So these are the four actions of the long non-coding RNAs. Now, if you talk about gene editing, it is done by the CRISPR, you know, clustered, regularly interspaced, interspaced short palindromic repeats. This is the full form of CRISPR. Example is the Cas9 nucleus. Out of which, now, these are not that important uh, as I feel. Now, obviously, another disclaimer I want to give is that if you see that in your college or in your state, some extra topics are there. So, please go through that. Whatever I feel is important from undergraduate and postgraduate and EPG and a postgraduate entrance examination point of view, I have mentioned here. Okay. Now, this is an, also an important diagram, but I'm going to first talk about the endocytosis that two kind of endocytosis a mechanism number one is the cavuli medi mediated endocytosis and number two is the receptor mediated endocytosis so what happens is what is this cavuli cavuli are the plasma membrane invaginations and what is cavulin cavulin is the structural protein of the cavule which uh, which are enriched in glycosphingolipids and cholesterol so you can see that uh, these are membrane invaginations these are called the cavuli which has the protein which is the cavulin so what happens how does this endocytosis take place so internalization of the cavuli along with the bound molecules and associated extracellular fluid is called photocytosis so it's just that they kind of take and incorporate into them uh, the molecules and the extracellular fluid that is known as the cell sipping which is the photocytosis which is done by the cavuli mediated endocytosis so this is again an important question these two are interconnected okay so this is an important question and the practical applications is that it kind of helps in supporting the transmembrane delivery of some molecules cavuli regulate the transmembrane signaling and the cellular adhesion via internalization of the receptors and the integrin so this is one type of endocytosis in which there is nothing it's just that there is a, a plasma invagination which has this cavuli uh, protein which invaginates and ultimately takes inside some of the molecules and the extracellular fluid known as the cell sipping next is the receptor mediated endocytosis the macromolecules bound to the membrane receptor so as you can see that there is uh, in this receptor mediated endocytosis the there is a coated pit okay there is a coated pit and this coated pit is called as the clathrin coated pit so initially what happens whatever the whatever macromolecules are there which are bound to the membrane receptors they are taken up by these regions of the plasma membrane known as the clathrin coated pits so once it is taken up by them since they are trapped within this uh, vesicles this is known as fluid phase pinocytosis so this is pinocytosis so pinocytosis has got an association with the receptor mediated endocytosis so please understand these two again are interlinked so this is how the, the questions will be asked you may be asked this and then this so you will again get confused so these two are interlinked okay so trapped within these vesicles is also a gulf of extracellular fluid which is the fluid phase pinocytosis now what happens is they form vesicles as you can see once they you know these are the vesicles okay but what happens is once these vesicles fuse uh, with the the acetic intracellular structure they form an early endosome and once there's formation of an early endosome these clathrin coated pits will no more be there means these you can see that when it was forming initially when the vesicles were forming the vesicles were coated with clathrin but once they are forming early endosome where the ph is low these vesicles will start losing the, cl the clathrin so there's no more clathrin you can see this red color covering is no more there okay and so so this formation of early endosome then formation of late endosome and then it will ultimately get fused with the lysosome so ultimately getting fused with the lysosomes you know that after which there will be endocytosis and uh, once uh, in the act in, and in the acidic environment of the endosomes the ldl and the transferrin receptors they will release their cargo which is then transported to the cytosol this, this is how the ultimately endocytosis will take place so i, so I hope that these two mechanisms make some sense to you now coming to the cytoskeleton uh, and this is the ability of this of the cells to adopt a particular shape maintain polarity organize intercellular organelles there are three kinds of cytoskeleton essentially number one is the actin microfilaments which are five to nine again this is an important question which uh <clears throat> The examples are the G actin monomers which polymerize into F actin. Okay, all these are important points. And the newly added subunits are added to the positive end of the strand and removed from the negative end of the strand, which is known as the actin treadmilling. So all these are important points. Next is the intermediate filaments, which are 10 nanometer in diameter. And these uh, intermediate filaments are, you know, they link the desmosomes and the hemidesmosomes. The examples are vimentin in meso mesenchymal cells, the desmin in the muscle cells, neurofilaments, glial fibrillary acid protein cytokeratin laminins etc now inter intermediate filaments again is an important short note next is your microtubules these are 25 nanometer this is again an important question and they are composed of non covalently polymerized alpha and beta tubulin again an important questions so uh, what are the function of microtubules they are basically acting as molecular motor proteins 
the two examples, the two varieties of these proteins are the kinesins and, dice and dynins, which are again an important question. Uh, the cilia is also forming the example of microtubules. Okay, so don't get confused. Cilia comes under microtubules and not intermediate filaments. So this is how you differentiate, and you have to know these are very basic concepts, which ultimately gives you know helps you to build a very strong base in uh, pathology. Now coming to the cell cell interaction, I'm not going to go into details of this, but I'm just going to mention you the important points: occluding junctions or tied junctions. They restrict the paracellular movement of ions and other molecules. Again, an important question: restrict the paracellular, which means between the cells there should not be any movement that's how that that's that is the function of the occluding junctions and next is uh, the, the examples are you know claudine and tight junction associated marvel protein or the tam families all these are important points and another is the zona occludens proteins family and and the function is mediated by the zona occludens uh, protein family so occluding junctions or zona occludens and tight junctions all are the same thing next is the anchoring junction which is called the adherence junction please don't get confused okay anchoring junctions is the adherence junction and the desmosomes so these again are the same thing so these words this juggling of words is important you, you may get confused here but this has got a very important implication which is very many many times asked in the mcq that loss of the epithelial adherence junction which means loss of the anchoring junctions or the adherence junction uh, protein that is the e cadherin so what is e cadherin e cadherin is basically an adherence junction protein so once it get lost there is no adherence and that is how this explains the basis of the discohesive invasive pattern of some gastric cancers and lobular carcinoma of the breast so this is a very important question and you must remember that this actually has a role to play with the anchoring junctions or the adherence junction and not the occluding junctions so i hope that this makes sense to you and then next is the communicating junctions or the gap junctions which permit the diffusion of this of the chemicals from one cell to another and they are composed of connexons which are a pair of hexamer so there are six units and that forms pores which uh, permit the passage of ions and all these kind of molecules they play an important role in cell to cell communication so again a very important question that communicating junctions or gap junctions play an important role in cell to cell communication these gap junctions are present in the cardiac myocytes which allow the cell to cell calcium fluxes that allow many cells of the myocardium to behave as a functional syncytium so functional syncytium of the myocardial cell is because of what is because of the communicating or the gap junctions or rather the connexons okay so i hope that this makes sense now coming to this waste disposal mechanism which is again some kind of reasonings or short notes are given from here so if you talk of the lysosomes and proteasomes these two are the waste disposal mechanisms of uh, a cell so you know that lysosomes they contain proteins called as proteases nucleases lipases glycosides phosphatases and sulfatases so they are basically synthesized these proteins or these enzymes are basically synthesized in the er lumen and then they are tagged with mannose 6 phosphate again an important question and then these modified proteins they are delivered to the lysosomes through the trans golgi vesicles so they are formed in the er and then they are transported to the trans golgi uh, vesicles okay so now the functioning of these lysosomes happen by three mechanisms okay number one is the fluid phase or the receptor mediated endocytosis i've already explained this before that there's formation of an endosome and then uh, they, they get ultimately fused with the lysosome this is called the fluid phase of the receptor mediated endocytosis number one number two is the mechanism of autophagy now autophagy has a very separate mechanism which i'll be dealing with i think it is there in the next chapter which is cell injury or something like that it is there in one of the chapter a detailed explanation is given so i'll be explaining this mechanism over there basically this formation of an autophagosome and that ultimately uh, you know that the cell itself eats up its own content so that is called autophagy and that's also a mechanism because it is associated with lysosome so basically the, the function of lys lysosome is explained here and number three is the phagocytosis uh, again that forms a phagosome and then ultimately will fuse with the lysosome so, so in kind of some, some kind of phagocytosis there is also uh, association and fusing with the lysosome so this is how the uh, waste disposal mechanisms happen and the next one is the proteasomes these proteasomes play an important role in integrating the cytosolic uh, proteins okay many proteins that are destined for destruction they are identified by covalently binding of a small protein called ubiquitin so proteasomes may kya hota obviously there is degradation of the proteins but these proteins they have to be first covalently binded with a small protein called ubiquitin okay so then only they undergo uh, this kind of degradation by proteasomes so, so proteasomes only degrade those proteins which are binded by ubiquitin so again these two are very connected terms which again plays an important mcq okay so heterophagomy is, is nothing much it is just that once this phagocytosis this formation of phagosome which ultimately get fused with the phagolysosome that's called heterophagy and autophagy may there is basically formation of an autophagosome which has got this lc3 protein okay 
as you can see here that um, these lysosome driven degradation are that as they are encircled with a double membrane vacuole derived from the endoplasmic reticulum and marked by the lc3 protein so autophagy may this lc3 protein is important which is there present in the autophagosome so this is again an important question and that ultimately gets fused with the lysosome and forming ultimately leading to degradation of these cells okay uh, now this is er stress as i mentioned initially that how what happens is uh, these chaperons they are you know, what are chaperons so mature folded proteins are formed by chaperons but what happens is when there you need to degrade these proteins then comes the role of proteasomes and these proteins are first you know tagged with ubiquitin as i mentioned and only after that they will get degraded by the proteasome but but if uh, you know there is excess amount of misfolded proteins and uh, these proteasomes cannot take care of it there's so much in excess uh, these misfolded proteins that is when the er stress will come into play you understand so first a mechanism is a proteasome which will destroy these misfolded proteins but when that that the limit is exceeded when there is excessive amount of misfolded proteins that is why that is when the er stress will come into play which is known as the unfolded protein response very very important which is the upr response okay and what happens in the upr response there is decrease in the protein synthesis the body mechanism decreases the, the protein synthesis mechanism in the body is getting decreased and there is increase in chaperon production because we know that chaperon they help in folding the proteins they help in folding the proteins so when there is an excessive amount of unfolded proteins the chaperon production is increased the protein synthesis is decreased that is called the er stress or the unfolded protein response but again if the body is not able to cope up with the excessive amount of stress then all of these mechanisms fail the first mechanism is proteasome second mechanism is er stress but again when all of these mechanisms fail ultimately the cell will undergo apoptosis okay i hope that makes sense this is an important question the mcqs are also explained here okay so now i i'm just going to put uh, some viewpoints regarding the signal transduction pathways this is a very important concept but uh, it's a very conceptual part and it's also very difficult signal transduction pathways are going to be very important when you talk about the chapter of neoplasia and i'm going to discuss these in detail probably over there but here there are two important diagrams which i want you to focus on see this uh, there is something called as the tyrosine kinase receptor this is the tyrosine kinase receptor and this is the kinase domain once it gets bind with a uh, ligand it is there is activation of this tyrosine kinase which ultimately leads to transcription and translation okay but there is also another kind which is called as the non receptor tyrosine kinase based receptor which do not have a tyrosine kinase receptor but there is this another component called non receptor tyrosine kinase which also kind of acts in the same way okay so then we have the gcpr ligand which ultimately helps in the formation of camp okay now let's talk about this that they are known as the serpentine receptor because they traverse the plasma membrane seven times okay this is again so once there is ligand bindings this gdp will get converted to gtp and that will ultimately give rise to the generation of camp and inositol uh, 145 triphosphate which will lead to the release of calcium and that ultimately cause the transcription so this is how it works and uh, so this is the mechanism how it works basically as you can see here okay now this image shows the signaling from a tyrosine kinase based receptor growth factor what happens is once there is binding of the growth factor that there is receptor dimerization as you can see there are two uh, you know parts so uh, once there is receptor dimerization there is auto phosphorylation of the tyrosine residues as you can see there is phosphorylation here which ultimately you know kind of activates the you know ras so you can see that the gtp is getting converted to gdp and that actually creates an active ras once the ras getting is getting activated then And there is uh, there are two pathways which can take place number 1 is the pi3k pathway pi3k and akt pathway which acts via the mtor mechanism and the other one is the raf pathway which activates the map kinase and that ultimately all of this will function through the mic protein which will cause the cell cycle progression so this is a difficult part actually i just wanted to explain this image because uh, you know signal transaction pathways again uh, come becomes important somewhere or the other you may get questions reasonings mcqs whatever important and difficult concept so i just uh, brushed up through this there are other also there are other kinds of receptors as well like the notch family the uh, like the notch family the wnt protein ligands the frizzled family and all of which will increase the level of beta catenin and that will ultimately cause the transcription so next is the transcription factors all of this see this chart is not uh, i i i don't think you i need to explain this chart because it's not that that important because all of which is implicated i don't think questions can be framed you know concepts much concepts can be framed from this image so i've left it 
Next, coming to the extracellular matrix, the ECM is a protein network that constitutes a significant proportion of any tissue. Cell interactions uh, with the ECM are critical for development, healing, and maintenance of the normal tissue architecture. So, what are the functions? Mechanical support, regulator of cell proliferation, scaffolding for tissue renewal, a foundation for establishment of tissue microenvironment. There are two basic forms. One is the interstitial matrix having the mesenchymal cells, and the non-fluid constituents are the a fibrillar and non fibrillar collagens like the fibronectin, elastin, proteoglycans, hyaluronate, and other constituents. So sometimes ECM can be asked as a short note, and that is why I have included this over here. As you can see, next is the basement membrane. What happens is the interstitial matrix. So this is the interstitial matrix within within the connective tissue. They become highly organized around the epithelial cells, endothelial cells, and smooth muscle cells where it forms the basement membrane. The major constituents are non-fibular type 4 collagen and laminin. This is again a very, very important question. Basement membranes made two most important major constituents will be your non-fibular type 4 collagen and laminin. This is again an important question. Now, the components are categorized into three. We have the fibrous structural proteins like the collagens and elastin, water hydrated gel like the proteoglycan, hyaluronic acid, etc. Adhesive glycoproteins. Okay. So, collagen mein kya hota hai? Ki, there are two kinds of collagen. Number one is the fibrillar collagen and number two is the non-fibrillar so fibrillar collagens are one two three and five and non-fibrillar is the type four this is again an important part non-fibrillar is the type four and the all others are fibrillar so there's an important important concept and mcq over here and that is the concept of lysyl hydroxylate so what happens is the tensile strength of this collagen happens because of cross-linking and this cross-linking again happens because of lysine hydroxylation okay so ultimately we understand that this tensile strength of the collagen is because of something called as lysine hydroxylation this process requires an enzyme called as lysyl hydroxylase and this enzyme is dependent on vitamin c so when there's a deficiency of vitamin c this enzyme will not work and that is when this collagen will not have this tensile strength and that is why the patients having having vitamin c deficiency they have skeletal deformities and they uh, you know they they heal poorly and they bleed easily because the collagen is not having the tensile strength over there there's no cross-linking happening over there okay and the genetic defects including the collagen and lysyl hydroxylase mutations they also cause a disease such as the osteogenesis imperfecta and certain forms of elher danlos syndrome so all these are important important points so the elastin then you must know that the central core of elastin is having an associated meshwork of fibrillin gly glycoprotein okay and this association with fibrillin explains an important point what is that this relationship partially explains why fibrillin synthetic defects lead to skeletal abnormalities and weakened arteriolar walls as in patients with marfan syndrome fibrillin also controls the availability of free tgf and these functions plays an important role in the pathogenesis of the marfan syndrome so marfan syndrome may fibrillin is an important mcq elastin is an important mcq so okay so you know how these two are interlinked now and that is why this explains why in marfan syndrome there is a weakened arterial arterial walls and skeletal deformities so all these interconnected words are important in your mcqs okay and this is this is how you should interlink the various points the various names because they may get you may get confused if you see in the exam instead of elastin you you find fibrillin you may get confused but then this is the most important part next is the proteoglycans and the hyaluronic acid which is the glycosamine glycans the examples are keratin sulfate and chondroitin sulfate so all these are important next is the adhesive glycoproteins and adhesion receptors fibronectin a major component of the interstitial ecm laminin a major constituent of basement membrane integrins are representative of the adhesion receptor known as the cell addition molecules so what is fibronectin it is having a disulfide link heterodimer again an important question so fibronectin is having a disulfide link heterodimer which is synthesized by fibroblasts monocytes and endothelium it has specific domains that bind to that bind to distinct ecm components okay laminin is the most abundant glycoprotein in the basement membrane i've already explained i've already put put the put forward this point before so it's just a repetition here integrins are heterodimers and they're composed of alpha and beta subunits i think i've already gone through all these points before the integrins they attach to the ECM component via a tripeptide arginine glycine aspartic acid motif. Again, an important point. Okay, tripeptide arginine glycine aspartic acid motif. Motif. So I hope that uh, this is all about it. There is uh, not much important other point in this chapter.
well so i hope that this makes sense to you so i just wanted to make sure that i put forward the high yielding areas which becomes important for all categories of students and if you have any more query you can mention on the comment section below and i would also appreciate if you can give any kind of feedback to me that you know how i should improve or what ex extra i should add into this or how i should uh, go about it if you can give me some inputs into that it will really be helpful for me because uh, i to be honest i have never seen any kind of videos like this in the youtube where you can actually open and you can open your robins and read it simultaneously so i decided to do this and obviously it takes a lot of effort because i'm ki kind of trying to balance my residency along with this so i'm going to uh, come very soon with the next chapter which is the cell injury a very very important chapter and a lot of questions a lot of mcqs a lot of concepts so if you uh, appreciate my effort and if you like this kind of videos then please consider subscribing my channel and i will meet you very soon in the next upcoming episode thank you Thank you.